uh, visitor, welcome. I'm going to start off with that. If you're a visitor, welcome today. Um, there's a little thing in your bulletin right there. If you will, fill it out, turn it in. That way we get to know who you are. If you're a visitor today, too, I'm going to work this in because we're having a teen dinner right across the parking lot um, in the Family Life Center. It's a, it's a fundraiser for camp. If you're a regular, head out the door, take a right, go on down there. It's going to be kind of like a, just a summer picnic, just some uh, barbecues and stuff like that. We have some cornhole set up, some ping pong set up. So just a good time to get together. You don't have to go out, worry about a restaurant, worry about a crowd, um, nothing like that. Just come on over. It is a fundraiser for a teen camp that comes up in July, so do remember that. Uh, Chuck Day is going to be here tonight, singer. You may see some um, posters out on the, the doors. He's going to be here tonight. We're going to take up a love offering for him. And there's one more thing. If you have been looking at your prayer request list or you've been here on Wednesday night, there's a name on there, Mark Aaron. That's Larry Freeland's nephew. He was in a motorcycle wreck, and he had a lot of chest damage. He actually passed away this morning. So I know we've mentioned him a couple weeks now in uh, Wednesday night service. So just remember that family. Um, said he was in his early 50s, Jeannie said. So do remember that family. It's just a great loss. If you will, let's, let's open up in prayer real quick, and I'll get out of the way. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for this time that we can come together with my brothers and sisters and uplift your name. You are the great and mighty God, the great Jehovah, the, the spirit that promises to come amongst us when we gather together in your name. We just want to do um, everything that we can this morning, Lord, just to uplift your name in song, in your word, and just in our our attitude as we come to you, Lord. We just want to give you all the honor and all the praise and glory. We thank you for this opportunity. In your name I pray, amen.
All right, as we're, uh, as we're all making our way back to our seats, we're going to continue in worship this morning. Um, one thing I noticed about the songs that we're singing today, um, they all have to do with, I'm, I'm going to give my praise. Um, whether it's the, the choir or, or the songs that we're singing, um, you all can remain standing if you want to. <laughs> if you don't want to, then don't. But um, you know, I've, I've been reading in, a, in this book, uh, probably for the past couple months because I'm a slow reader, uh, about worship and about how it's, um, you know, as, as, as people, as people made in the image of God, like we're constantly worshiping. We can't not worship. Um, but the, the idea of, of our worship is we, we aim it. Uh, and, and today, like, I, I really want us to intentionally um, and, and very uh, fervently aim our, our worship, our focus, the, the efforts of our, our heart um, towards the only thing that's worthy of worship this morning. So as we, uh, as we sing this first song, um, praise the Father, praise the Son, uh, let's, let's aim, let's, let's direct it at, at that one that's worthy.
Good morning. I'm happy to be here this morning and these two to sing with me. I've sang this song a few times, but this is the one that they love. This is the one that they wanted to learn, so we're going to do it again for you, okay? Ready? There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, you know it sends out a light, a light that I might see, a light that shines in darkness. My ship would say no word. Now everybody that lives around us, they say, why don't you tear that old lighthouse down? Big ships, they don't sail by this way. There's no use in that old thing standing round. But then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time, thank God I saw the light. It was the light from that old lighthouse, and it still stands up there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin.
I'll give it up for him. How many of you are planning on coming out to the music this evening? How many of you invited somebody? I understand that this man is one of the better Southern gospel singers around. Uh, Rick, if it isn't, Rick's in trouble. <laughs> no, we, he'll come from a love offering. I think that's great. So he'll have the whole service of singing to us, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you all. Open your Bibles to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to continue a series that we started several weeks ago on spiritual warfare, precisely talking about the armor of God. As we were talking about the importance of the armor of God, <clears throat> I mentioned to you several weeks ago that one of the things that's so important that you find in the scriptures is to be filled with the Spirit of God. Being filled with the Spirit of God is a command in the scriptures. It's not a suggestion. God expects you to be filled with His person because when you're filled with His person, you're filled with His power. And today we see the church struggling. We see individual Christians struggling. And the main reason that we struggle is that we are not connected as deeply as we need to be with the Spirit. God is not controlling us. When it talks about being filled with the Spirit, it's talking about the idea of God controlling you, not you controlling you. You have to remember that when you accepted Christ as your Savior, you made a, a choice to give up your life to allow Him to live His life through you. And I think that's probably a pretty good deal because He gives you eternal life. And eternal life, again, is living forever. Amen? But it's much more than that. That's a fringe benefit from having eternal life. Eternal life is to have an intimacy with God. And we couldn't have that when we were in our sin still. And I am no longer in my sin. I've been delivered from my sin. If you're a child of God, you've been delivered from your sin as well. We are children of God. And our sin has been washed away by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He remembers our sins no more. It doesn't mean I don't sin. I'm a saint who sins. But the Bible tells us in 1 John, when we do sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to restore not so much our sonship because that can never be changed. We're in His family when we accepted Him, and that can never be changed. But it does affect our fellowship, that intimacy that we want to have with Him. And so we were looking at Ephesians chapter 6 is where you need to go. Verse 10 is where I want to start. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you're going to be strong in the Lord, you have to understand that your strength comes from Him. We're in this physical realm, and we have physical issues, physical problems. This, the cost of sin in this world and in our lives is immense. And so he's talking to children of God, and he says, Brethren, I want you to understand something. I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Doesn't that sound good? But how do we do that? Well, he tells us, first of all, why we need to be strong in His power and in His might. In verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And that word wrestle carries the idea of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, when you have a spiritual issue, a spiritual battle going on in your life, it's not you and everybody else. It's usually this you. And that's why it says that for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's one-on-one -on -one as we wrestle against, and look what we wrestle against, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our enemy is not earthly. Our enemy is heavenly. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy the church. 
because we were made in the image of God. What a blessing that is, amen? To be made in the image of God, and we give glory to God. And Satan doesn't want that because he wants all the glory for himself. And the Bible tells us so precisely that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and what's the last one? The devil. But in our society today, we don't really think of the spiritual realm as being real. We're talking about that on Wednesday night. You're all welcome to come out to that. But we think that, you know, the spiritual realm isn't that real. But if you read through the scriptures, especially the Gospels, there was a lot of demon activity that Christ was involved in, casting out demons. They're still here today. And they're still powerful today. And they seek to destroy us. And we need to make sure that we are using the power of his might to do battle against these evil things that come our way. And that's important to do. That's who we fight against. That's who we wrestle against. But I want you to scoot back up. I don't have it here, but look at verse 11. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. One of the things that we don't do as children of God, we don't put on the whole armor of God. We'll get to that verse in a minute. We don't put on the whole armor of God. Mostly, we don't put on any of the armor of God. We just get up in the morning, and we go about our life, and we haven't even thought about being filled with the Spirit. We haven't even looked at the Word of God. Many times, we haven't prayed. We haven't thought about God because we're so involved in our own life. That's a wile of the devil, a trick of Satan to get your mind totally on you and totally off of him, him whom our power comes from and through. And that's why it says here in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Who has to put it on? You have to put it on. I have to put it on. He's not going to put it on for us. You know, this idea of let go and let God is not biblical. We think that God's going to do everything. I'm here to tell you, God has done so many great things for us. Amen? But you are required to put on. The, he has supplied it to you. Now he says, put it on. Put on the whole armor, armor of God. For what purpose? That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I don't know about you, but I like to be victorious in Christ. I want our church to be victorious in Christ. I want our, my family, your family, to be victorious in Christ. I want Jesus to be glorified for all the things that he's given to me. So I'm going to learn to put on the armor of God that I might glorify this one who loved me so much that he died on that cross for me. He didn't have to. But he did, and he gives me this armor that I can do battle and be victorious in this life. Then why don't we put it on? Well, it's because we don't know what it is many times. And so take up the whole armor of God. Have you done that? Well, we talked about last time we were together. It talked about verse 14. Stand there for having girded your waist with truth. With truth. What is the, the belt of truth? We talked about it. You probably don't remember because we talked about it two weeks ago, and you probably don't remember that at all. Matter of fact, on Monday, you probably don't remember what I preached on Sunday. The scary thing about it is happens to me sometimes, you know. But I want you to understand the belt of truth is it's mentioned first because it's the most important, in a sense. Truth. The truth that we find in God's word, but the truth that we find in the person of Christ. His word is truth, and he is truth. And so when we think about putting on the belt of truth, we have to be totally committed to the Lord. Let's just stop there for a minute, kind of review. Are you totally committed to the Lord? That's a word we don't use in our society much today, commitment. Commitment. We see marriages in our country today, our families are falling apart. Commitment. People are not committed to their families, they're not committed to their church. Many people aren't committed to hardly anything. So let me just ask you a very simple question as a child of God. Are you committed to Jesus? Are you committed to his truth? I hope that you are. Because it refers really to the idea of having a life that's built upon the faithfulness of the word of God and to the God of the word. Would you say that describes you? Are you committed to the word of God, the truth of God, and to the person of God. Because that's the first thing that you put on every day. Well, how do you do that? We talked about that last time. You spend some time in the word of God. You know, God gave you this word for a purpose, didn't he? You think about how God has preserved his word. 
how over the centuries it's been hated and maligned and burned and, and tossed away. But we still have it today for the purpose of giving us what we need to be victorious in Christ. It is God's truth for you. It is God's truth for me. And it's amazing to me how many Christians don't spend any time with it at all. And if you don't spend any time with it all, you can't put on the belt of truth. You can't gird it on because you don't know what the truth is. You have to spend time in the scriptures. You have to spend time in the word of God. Otherwise, the rest of the armor is absolutely useless. If you're not putting on the truth of God and committing yourself to his word and his person, you're not going to put on the other aspects of the armor of God as well. And that's why we get blasted right out of the water. We're not prepared. We're not prepared for the war that we're involved in. It says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Man, I can't fight those things by myself, but God can. He's given me the victory. I just have to put it on. And when I have the armor of God on, I'm going to be successful as a Christian. I'm going to be successful as a member of my church. I'll be successful as a Christian family because I'm learning it for myself. I teach it to my wife or my husband, and I teach it to my children that they might be successful as well. That's important. It's important to get that. That's the first aspect that we talked about, having, your, having girded, girded your waist with truth. That was a typo, but, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. Buckle up, boys. We're going somewhere. Then it says, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is an interesting thing. The breastplate of righteousness really just covered your innards, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your vital organs. And by the way, there was nothing on the back. It was open because a Roman soldier was not running away. He stood and looked his foe in the face. We talk about the shoes, the gospel of peace later on, and we'll talk more about that. But God didn't call us to be cowards. God called us to be strong in his might. Whose might? Not mine. I don't have any, but his might. And so the breastplate was made of hammered steel, put together, hammered metal to protect me or protect the Roman soldier. We'll talk about me in a minute from the arrows and the swords and the spears that would come his way. Because back in those days, if you got a wound in your chest that affected one of your vital organs that didn't have antibiotics and things like that, you were probably liable to die. Because that was the main part of, of what kept you alive. And so the spiritual significance of it, that he tells Tim to put on the, the breastplate of righteousness, to remember that it covers my heart, but it also covers my bowels. And that's important to look at because it talks about that. Look in Philippians chapter 1 verse 8. It's on the screen. You don't need to turn there. It says, for God is my record how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Now we don't use that word much today, do we? Unless you go to the doctor, something like that. But look at the New King James and that's the verse that's quoted right underneath that. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. The ancient world thought that your emotions and feelings were centered in your innards, in your bowels, in the lower part. And your heart was the area that kept your, your mind and kept your will. And so those are important things, your mind and your will and your emotions. And so when it talks about the bowels in the King James, it's talking about affections. It's talking about that aspect of your emotions. It says in Philippians 2.1, if there be anything, or if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, and the King James says, if any affection and mercy. Kind of puts it up to where we are today just a little bit. Colossians 3.12, put on therefore as the elect of God. What's an elect of God, by the way? How many of you elect of God? Hey, if you're born again, you're an elect of God. You're chosen. That's what the word means. You're chosen by God. That's a good thing, isn't it? Bowels of mercy, tender humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Bowels, again, is the idea of tender mercies. It's the idea of emotions. And so the two areas of life, and this is important to get, the two areas of life, and people miss this all the time, 
the two areas of life where Satan frequently attacks the people of God are in their minds and in their emotions. And the breastplate covered the heart and covered the, the bowels where they thought those things were harbored. So God gives us armor to protect our minds and our emotions. And that's important because that's where Satan attacks us. And he's good at that. Satan will fill our minds with false doctrines and false emotions. Have you ever had that happen? You think somebody doesn't like you in church and you don't want to go back to church anymore. Where do you think that comes from? You know, if you have something against somebody, what should you do? Or you think somebody has something against you, why don't you go talk to them? Heaven forbid we do that. We just don't do that. We just get mad and go someplace else. You shouldn't do that. That's one of the wiles of the devil. Because we haven't put on the breastplate of righteousness. And he's allowing our emotions to be deceived. But also, if you're not in the scriptures, and that's why the belt of truth was first, it's so easy for him to send you false doctrine. It's amazing how many times I've talked to people over the years about different aspects of theology, different aspects of uh, doctrine, and, and they're over here in, in right field where there's not many balls get hit, you know. And I ask them, why do you believe that? And the reason they believe that is because they were taught it by somebody. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care who's teaching or who's preaching. You go back to the Word of God. The Word of God is your truth. The person of God is the truth, not me, not the teacher. It's God is the truth. You need to go back to the word of God and see, does, is that what that person is saying and teaching? Does that match the word of God? But to be able to do that, you have to know the word of God. Amen? Hello? Yeah, that's exactly right. You have to know it. Satan will use the wicked world around us. Is this world wicked? When you start having kids going to school and killing each other, there is a big problem in this school. This country needs Jesus. You can't take morality out of everything and expect everything to be okay. Kids have no hope. Life means nothing. And those people's lives mean nothing. And we can't see what the problem is. It's amazing to me. Again, Satan will use this wicked world that's around us to tempt us with wrong thoughts and wrong emotions. And that's exactly what we see these young men doing. It's sad. It's really sad. And he, can he fights against us in many ways. One of the ways that I think he does, and I wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget it, Satan wants to strip the truth from our minds. And by stripping the truth from our minds, he begins to fill it with his own perverted ideas. Or sometimes your own perverted ideas, what you think is right. It's not about what you think, it's about what he says that makes it right. You follow what he says. Now you might think something, but it needs to match up to the scripture, it needs to match up to the word of God, because I'm committed to the word of God, right? You're committed to the word of God, and you're also committed to the God of the word. Is that true? So whatever comes into my life, everything has to match that, and my priorities has to match the word of God. So there again, let's pause just for a moment and ask ourselves, do my priorities match the Word of God? Is God the most important thing in my life? It gets quiet when you say things like that. Of course, it's the Baptist church. We're quiet anyway. But is He the most important thing in your life? You know, the true great commandments was to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do you stand with that one? And love your neighbor as yourself. We get mad at our neighbor, and we get mad, so mad sometimes that we just don't come to church, or, or we don't talk to that person. Again, that's an attack of Satan against you. But sometimes we don't realize it because we don't see it. And so you have to understand that Satan wants to make light of our sins. And so he attacks our emotions and he attacks our mind. He desensitizes us to sin. I've shared this with you before. When I was a policeman, which has been a long time ago now. I saw things as a young man that after a while didn't bother me at all. You get desensitized to things. Christians can be involved in sin for so much and so long that they begin to overlook sin in their own life. And I'm here to tell you that's probably true of everybody in this room. Yes, I'm talking about you as much as I'm talking about me. You have to learn to recognize sin. Satan wants you to just gloss over it and pretend it's not there. And after a while, you don't even see it. I always think when we have communion, how many times that we have to partake of it in a way that 
is pleasing to him, to do it in the right way. Otherwise, we eat and drink damnation to ourselves, or judgment not discerning the Lord's body, and for that, he judges us with sickness and death. Have you been desensitized to sin in your life? Because if you've been desensitized, I guarantee you, uh, moms and dads, so have your children. Because they see what's right in the home, then it must be right. And that causes problems because your children will never learn to put on the armor of God. Desensitize. You've got to watch that. That's something that Satan uses. But also rationalize. Have you ever done that with your sin? Huh? Some of you are going, yeah. Some of you are going, yeah, we rationalize sin all the time. We try to justify it. That's probably a better word. It's okay because, you know. I can have premarital sex because, hey, we're going to get married sometime in the next 10 years. Cool. You can't rationalize sin. It is what it is. We're supposed to confess our sins. Jesus told him to go and sin no more. It's not something that we as children of God should be doing. So be careful. Be careful. Satan will try to attack the way that you think and the way that you feel. He just does that. Look at, flip in your Bible to, if you will, to uh, Romans 13. Verse 11, and we'll read a couple of verses there. It's on page 1306 in my Bible. And none of you have one, like a, I'm sure, like mine. So it's maybe not even in that area. Okay, so you're better off just looking in your table of contents. You got it? Romans 13, let's start at verse 11. It says, And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Who has to throw off the darkness, the works of darkness? And that's sin. Who has to do that? We do. And who has to put on the armor of light? We do. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We're to be different. We're called to be different. We are Christians. We bear His name for a purpose. And when people see you and people see me, they need to see Jesus. Amen? So what do they see when they see you? The people at work, your family. Do they see somebody who's dedicated to the truth of God? Do they see somebody who's dedicated to the glory of God? Do they see a person who's committed? And if they see somebody who's committed, I guess the question would be, what aren't they committed to? What are you committed to, making a living? You're going to die. This life is only 70, 80 years old if you're lucky. And then comes forever. It's the forever part that you ought to be concerned about. Amen. That's right. And so the breastplate of righteousness offers protection against the attacks of the devil. And once it's in place, he's unable to attack us in those realms of our emotions, our affections, and our mind. But what is the breastplate of righteousness? Well, some people think it's being self-righteous. Self-righteous, you know. God's going to be pleased with my life because look what I do for him. I keep this, I keep this, I keep this, and I start feeling that I'm better than everybody else because of what I can do. I possess a standard that's higher than yours. It must be higher than yours because I'm better than you. And my righteousness is great. My righteousness is right down the money, but you're not saved by your righteousness. You know that, don't you? The Bible says the best our righteousness is, according to Isaiah 64, is filthy rags. And that's a gross picture when you look at what it literally says. If you are living your life and thinking that the breastplate that protects you is your self-righteousness, you're not going to have any peace in your life. And you're not going to have any joy in your life. You know why? 
because you're not following God. And when you're not following God as a child of God, there's a conflict. Ask David. You remember David? A man after God's own heart. What did he do? He messed up big time with sin. He wasn't watching. And what happened to him? Fell into sin, big sin. And was he happy? He was really enjoying himself. If you read Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, man's miserable. 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 He lost his joy. He lost his joy. And so it's not talking about self-righteousness. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 20, and this is a, a good verse to think about. It says, for I say to you, this is Jesus speaking in Matthew 5, 20, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Wow. You know, we always talk about how stupid the Pharisees were with their dumb rules, their own self-righteousness and stuff. Jesus says, hey, you've got to have more righteousness than they do. I think sometimes that's all the righteousness that we have is that self-righteousness that we have. That makes us better than everybody else. That's why we get mad at people. You have to realize that people are just like you. They mess up. We're just messed up people. Sinful people that have been blood washed and blood bought, but we're still that way. And so if, if it's not self-righteousness, the breastplate is not self-righteous, what kind of righteousness is it? Well, maybe it's imputed righteousness. You know, the Bible does tell us in Romans 6, it says that he has made us to be sin for us, speaking of Jesus who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is another verse that says that. But here, it's impossible. You have to understand, it's impossible for you to put on that kind of righteousness. Why? Because it's already been given to you. The moment you were saved, God justified you. He declared you to be righteous. Are you righteous? Practically speaking, you are not righteous. But positionally speaking, you are. Praise God. It's a practical aspect that we work on. And so it's not talking about his imputed righteousness. This righteousness, this imputed righteousness, is wonderful because it puts me into the family of God. It saves me from hell. Isn't it great to know that I'm not going to hell? But God didn't save me just to keep me from going to hell. You've got to get that right. He saved you that you could glorify him. Does he need that? No, but he gives us the opportunity to do it. That's exciting. We sing songs like we did today. You should feel something. You know, that foot should tap a little bit. That was one, one leg. That's pretty good. Didn't fall over or anything. But this imputed righteousness that he gives to us does not protect us from the attacks of the enemy. It's there. But it doesn't protect us from the attacks of the enemy. So what is it? Well, it's very simple. It's practical righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is a life that's lived in simple obedience to the word of God. Is that simple? That's all it is. It's a life that's lived in simple obedience to the word of God. I learn every day of my life to walk my life in a way that glorifies him, a way that follows the scriptures, in a way that allows him to control me. Because when I accepted Christ as my savior, I gave my life up to him. And so did you. I'm his. He can do with me whatever he wants to do because I don't own me anymore. I'm a slave that's been bought and paid for. I belong to him. And that's important to realize that. We don't live our lives that way. Salvation is not based on anything that we've done. That's why self-righteousness doesn't help you. But it's based on what we have been given in Jesus. What have you been given in Jesus? Well, salvation, life. Eternal life, eternal blessing, opportunities to glorify him, spiritual gifts to be used for the body of Christ. But not having this righteousness, living out this practical righteousness in our life by having, of course, the, the belt of truth, committing ourselves to the Bible, committing ourselves to the God of the Bible, putting it on so we're protected. Our heart and our minds are protected from Satan when he comes. But if we don't put it on, it causes some problems. What does it cause? Well, it robs you of your spiritual joy. 
Have you ever had that happen to you? Remember when David prayed in Psalm 51, 12, he said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Two words to listen. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Not my salvation. You know, I didn't save myself. I don't save anybody. We just preach the word of God, and those are his will come. Amen? That's just how that works. You came, I came. It's his salvation. And it says, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Whose spirit? Not mine. Mine's a frail thing. Mine waffles too often. But his is always strong. And so be careful. If you don't put on the breastplate of righteousness, you are going to be an absolutely miserable Christian. You're not going to have any joy. There's no joy in Mudville. I've seen lots of Christians that way. That's mighty Casey, by the way. You know, they just walk around, woe is me, they're Eeyores. That resembles me sometimes. I'll be the first to admit that. But be careful. Be careful that you don't lose your joy. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. It can also rob you of your spiritual fruit. Of your spiritual fruit. It says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And I think many times in our lives as Christians, in our lives as church members, we try to do everything in our own power, by our own strength, and that's why nothing ever gets accomplished. People don't get saved, things don't get done for the Lord because we're stuck in ourselves. Jesus is the vine, and we are in him, and we are to abide in him, and he will abide in us. That's the idea of being spirit-filled, and it says that we will bear much fruit. But when we are out of fellowship with the Spirit, any achievements that we do are like a, well, vanity. It's all vanity. It's like a soap bubble. You just pop it. It looks good. Pop it, and it was nothing. Many of the things that we do, we take pride in, in the long run, are really just nothing. So lacking the breastplate of righteousness will rob you of your spiritual, your spiritual fruit. I have a couple more I want you to see. Rob you of your spiritual rewards. One of the things I look forward to is standing before the Lord and realizing that a lot of things I have coming, I'm not going to get. I don't look forward to that, but I think that's probably how it's going to be, don't you think? You know, we did all this for you, Lord, but when we stand before him, we find out the reasons that we did all the things for him. Sometimes it was for the wrong reasons. We did it for ourselves. We did it for the church. We did it for whatever purpose. You know, sometimes I'll be honest with you, I'm just glad I'm saved. I might be one of those people who come through the fire that says saved as of by fire. I mean, I'm, I don't have nothing else. I'm just me. Thank you, Lord, for just saving me. I messed up everything else. But you don't have to mess up everything else. God expects you to be victorious. That's why he gives you this armor to be victorious in. It will rob you of your spiritual rewards. Without being holy, without holding on to the truth of God's word, without being obedient to his righteousness and his word, Nothing that you do is going to be pleasing to the Lord. You're going to lose it all. It's amazing today how many people don't even know what your spiritual gifts are. God gives you spiritual gifts for the purpose of glorifying Him. If you can't glorify Him, all those rewards that you could have by using that gift is going to be a little soap bubble. If it gets popped and it's gone, it's not going to be yours. Let me give you one more. When you lack putting on the breastplate of righteousness, you dishonor God. I think we could stop right there, don't you think? To dishonor God, is that something that you want to do, is dishonor this one who loved you and came to the earth and died upon that cross and took upon himself your sins and your punishment, your hell? He did that for you because he loved you. Do you want to dishonor this one? But we live that way, amen? Why? We don't have on the breastplate of righteousness. And we bring reproach to the name of of the Lord and His glory. How do we do that? Well, you know, when you live your life differently than you're in church, you know, when you're in church, everybody's good, holy, aren't we? We dress good, we look good, we smell good. Some of us do. I mean, you think about that. You know, you do that. But when you go out into the world and you live different, you act different, and, you know, people ask you questions that you don't have answers for. You bring reproach to the name and the glory of God. That's why people say, I won't want to come to that church because there's nothing there but 
hypocrites. That's the idea. That's the type of life that you'll have if you don't put on the breastplate of righteousness. How about you? Have you put it on? 2 Corinthians tells us, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What that is saying, everything that I do, everything I think is going to be for the glory of God. Is that you? That's the bare minimum. That's Christianity 101. That's what God expects from us. And so when we have on the breastplate of righteousness, we are going to live lives that are clean and pure and bring glory to God. And isn't that what we want to do? I had Scott pose for me in the armor of God. And you can't really see that, but it says, cool. So when you have the armor of God on, it's cool. Why? I'm doing something for God. I'm doing something that he expects me to be doing. I'm doing something that pleases him, that honors him, that glorifies him. I'm giving my life to him so I can have victory over this one that he's already defeated. And I can defeat him in my practical everyday life. So that's what God wants from you. To commit yourself to the armor of God, to put on the, the belt of truth, but put on the breastplate. And don't turn your back to the enemy. Know the word of God and look him right in the eye and say, I'm not moving back. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm not going any further. You've got to come over top of me. That's what God expects us to do. So where are you at with the armor today? You know, you can't put the armor of God on unless you're a child of God. Did you know that? Don't look at her. Look at me. I'm much more handsomer than she is. See, men are handsome, right? See, you're, she's beautiful, amen? Amen. amen. But, you know, you can't, you can't put on the armor of God unless you know Jesus. And there's lots of people today who think they know Christ who don't know Christ at all because they don't put on any of the armor of God. They don't read the scriptures. They don't pray. They come to church sporadically. Is that your life? Are you committed to Christ? Are you committed to Jesus? Now, if you don't know Jesus, you come and see me while I'm here, and I'm here all the time. You just have to talk to me or call me. But I do want to get an invitation today for all of you folks. I want you to ask yourself, am I committed to Christ? Am I truly committed to who he is? And what I want you to do is just stand up and come forward and say, I'm committed. You don't have to come if you don't want to. That's fine. But coming forward saying, Pastor, I'm standing in the gap, and I'm saying I am committed to Christ. If that's you, you just get out of your seat. You come down, and you say, Pastor, I want to be committed to Christ. I'm doing the best I can. And if you can't come, that's fine. It could be because you can't get up here, and it could be because you don't want to come up here. But the main thing is that you're committed to Christ. I get lonely up here by myself, so I thought y'all come visit me. You know, when you take a stand like this and you say, you, you know, I'm doing something unusual. You know, I don't usually come forward in church and you don't have to come forward to mean anything in your life, but it, it kind of shows us something of where we are and who we are. So I want to ask you to commit yourself to being committed to him. So easy to do. He did the hard work, right? And now all he requires us to do is put on the armor of God to glorify him and allow him to shine through us. And that's what I ask you to do. Shine for him. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for all the blessings that we have in Christ. And Father, as we learn to put on the armor of God, we're going to be awesome. We're going to be people that are different, people that are a blessing not just to you, but to ourselves and to our church and to our families. Father God, we want to be victorious in Christ. We want to put Satan on the run. The Bible says if we resist him, he will flee from us. Teach us how to resist him, Father God. Help us to put on the armor. Help us to know what it is that you might receive glory from our lives. You, you saved us for a purpose. Help that purpose, Father, be to glorify you. Father, there'd be somebody here this morning that's not saved. I pray, God, that they would come and see me and talk to me about that truth. 
I'd love to talk to them about it. I, for, for weeks, I remember when I was first thinking about salvation, I couldn't come forward to talk to anybody because that's too backward. But Lord, when I did, it made a difference. So Lord, speak to that heart. We don't save anybody. Lord, you do through your word. And I just pray that that soul would be touched. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the day that you've given to us today. We look forward to tonight and the music that we're going to have. This is an opportunity to, to sit back and to listen. Uh, we serve a musical God. And every once in a while, it's just good to sit down and listen to music. So, Lord, touch our hearts today by how you've made us. We praise you, O Lord, for the blessings of life. We thank you so much for your son. I thank you for these dear people. Glorify yourself, Father, in us, that people might see Jesus in each one of us as we pass through this world. Help us pass through this world, making a difference in this one as we look forward to glorifying you in the next. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.